All right, we're uh, in Romans chapter 1, if you want to turn there, and um, starting uh, a, new, uh, a new book study here after our uh, completion of uh, the book of Genesis. So we're going to look at uh, what we are calling Paul's introduction, the first seven <laughs> verses. That The introduction to the book actually goes further on to about verse 16 or so. Uh, the first seven verses in the Greek are actually one long sentence, but... Uh, we're going to look at that uh, this morning, Paul's uh, introduction, kind of give you a little bit of uh, uh, overview of the book before we begin. Help us understand the importance of the book. We uh, certainly could say that the book of Romans uh, changed the Western world. And the way that that happened was because of a young uh, Roman Catholic monk uh, who felt so inadequate to try to somehow, he thought, deserve a relationship uh, with Jesus Christ. Uh, he felt he had to do something to try to deserve uh, the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And part of that was because of the church he was part of, the traditions that uh, had come about, the idea that grace was something that was actually uh, earned or given out as you complete certain tasks. And frustrated over that, uh, that uh, process, uh, he ends up, uh, though very devout, ends up being sent uh, on an assignment to Rome for a short period of time where he witnessed uh, firsthand the, uh, the absolute corruption in the church at that time, uh, not only in terms of the leadership of the church, but the immorality uh, of the church, which was, uh, by all accounts, uh, just rampant. It was just, uh, just terrible. Uh, again, this is in the 15, 1500s in Western Europe. Uh, further discouraged uh, after that trip, he was given an assignment to go to another university in Germany where he would then teach to seminary students the Book of Romans. So he began to study, and of course he knew Greek, Hebrew, Latin, uh, as well as German, and he began to study uh, in the Greek uh, this letter that we're about ready to study, uh, and it opened his eyes and it absolutely changed his life as he realized that God was calling us to have a relationship with him that was based on faith alone uh, by his grace. Grace being a free gift of God, not something that was earned. And of course, that young uh, monk was uh, Martin Luther. Uh, and Luther went on and, uh, and uh, is credited with what we refer to as the Protestant Reformation. Protestant meaning he was protesting against certain key doctrines uh, that were held by the Roman Catholic Church which is the dominating political and world power of Western uh, Europe at that time. He was protesting three doctrines. <laughs> One is that we would, he would say we're saved by faith alone. Uh, and uh, he would say, again, not by any works, but by faith and scripture alone. That scripture is the final authority uh, and the idea of the priesthood of every believer. That you don't have to go to another man, another person, uh, to confess your sins, ask for prayer, get right with God. Uh, there is only one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, as Paul would say uh, to young Timothy. Uh, and so those are the three chief doctrines that he was protesting against. Therefore, you have the Protestant protesting reformation, seeking not to break away from, but to bring a reformation within the Roman uh, Catholic Church. Of course, that didn't go over too well. And by the time he nailed his 95 thesis to the, uh, uh, the Wittenberg Castle door, uh, which really primarily dealt with the selling of indulgences uh, in purgatory and so forth, uh, it was pretty much his time with the Roman Catholic Church was pretty much over. And, and he went on to, of course, establish the church there in Germany uh, and many others in other parts of Europe. But it all begins because he studies the book of Romans and discovers what Christianity really is and really is not. Uh, there was another young man who was already in the ministry in the, in the 18th century and uh, in Great Britain. He was actually was already a missionary, but he didn't actually have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ because at that time the church again was so institutionalized uh, in England and Great Britain that he simply just chose it as a vocation to go into the ministry as many did at the time. Uh, coming back from America, where he went to preach the gospel to the American Indians, frustrated over that experience in his whole life, he went to a meeting one night where he heard the minister read the introduction of Martin Luther's commentary on the book of Romans. And as he said, 
my heart felt strangely warmed, and uh, and he and he uh, received Christ as his Lord and Savior on faith alone. Uh, and his name was John Wesley, and uh, he went on and uh, had a huge impact on Great Britain, and was part of what we call the Second Great Awakening uh, here in the United States. Another uh, person we're familiar with in church history is John Bunyan. John Bunyan, again, after his study of the Book of Romans, goes on and writes the classic Pilgrim's Progress, which has sold more copies than any other book ever published except the Bible itself. So if you haven't read that one, <laughs> you, you're missing it. And they do have it in a children's version, by the way, if you're not a speed reader. But uh, great, uh, great book, and obviously has uh, influenced uh, men and women for uh, many centuries. Paul is writing this book from uh, Corinth, and again, so important because uh, it, uh, uh, Romans will teach us really what Christianity is and then how to live the Christian life. He's writing from Corinth, and we know that because at the end of the letter, he'll address several people. He'll address people that are already in Rome. <clears throat> he'll mention those that are with him uh, in Corinth. And in, uh, in chapter uh, 1 of verse 14 of uh, the letter to uh, Corinthians, <clears throat> we have a mention of Gaius who lives uh, there in Rome. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, in, in Corinth, we've, uh, you'll find the reference to, uh, to Gaius. And um, uh, which ties up uh, Paul's writing back to uh, uh, being in Corinth itself. We also have a reference to Erastus, and uh, archaeologists have found a, uh, a stone uh, there in Corinth with the, the name of Erastus on it because he was a city official, as Paul indicates here at the book, uh, at the end of uh, the book of Romans. So uh, these two guys tie us directly to uh, the city of Corinth, uh, Paul writing from there to Rome place he wanted to go to had never made it to yet. He's writing around 57, 58 uh, AD, and we know that because he mentions uh, Aquila or Aquila and Priscilla, who uh, from the book of Acts we know are tent makers, and Paul uh, meets them, disciples them, uh, and they become partners with him in the ministry. They, like all other Jews, had been kicked out of Rome at some point in time. Uh, I believe it was under Claudius. Uh, and then when Nero takes the, the throne initially before uh, the real tribu tribulation and persecution begins, Jews are allowed back into Rome. Uh, and we've got uh, Aquila or Aquila and Priscilla in Rome at that time. So therefore, we can kind of peg the date around 57, 58 AD when they were allowed back into the city of Rome itself. Uh, the theme of Romans is that the just shall live by faith. Uh, and let's read verse 16 and 17. Uh, uh, really so much of Romans can be uh, uh, encapsulated in these two verses. Where Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, first for the Jew and also for the Greek. For in, the, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. There Paul Quoting uh, Habakkuk, the just shall live by faith. And pretty much a, a key, again, to uh, Paul's writing, helping us understand <clears throat> what it is to be a Christian and to live the Christian life. Uh, in uh, verse 11 and 12, uh, he mentions um, his purpose in writing. There it says, For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts, so that you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. So Paul wants to go to Rome. He's hoping that it's a stopover on his way to Spain. He wants to get the gospel all the way up into Southern Europe. Uh, and he's saying that he's going to come for their mutual edification, for the encouragement and the building up of both of them. Uh, and that, uh, that is always the case. I mean, if we, if we go to minister to someone else, for someone else, and that's in our mind, usually we end up being ministered to ourselves, encouraged ourselves. Uh, if we, uh, you know, uh, have a day where it's my day, don't bother me. Those usually aren't really the, <laughs> the best days. Uh, it's the days when you know, we really set out to, uh, uh, to serve, to, to minister somebody else. It's really uh, uh, the best days. I, you know, I just think of the, uh, the men's retreats when we, when we go out there. Uh, it's such a great time. The guys have such a, a good time out there. Uh, and uh, as we say, it's really taken on a life of its own over the years. But 
Uh, I go out with no pretense <laughs> that I'm going to have any good time, enjoyment, free time, anything else, because it's pretty nonstop. It's less than 24 hours, and we pack uh, uh, four teaching sessions and the worship times and uh, everything else that we do. It's just, it's pretty busy, and I'm pretty busy uh, the whole time. Uh, I'm under no delusion that... Uh, uh, that uh, somehow I'm going to squeeze in some time to squeeze in a volleyball match or a basketball game or anything else. It's just not going to happen. Uh, I'm not going surfing between uh, during one of the sessions or anything, you know. But, you know, I just resign myself. We're there for a reason, for a purpose, and we're there to serve the body of Christ and the guys. And uh, it's, uh, you know, been very fruitful. But, of course, it ends up being just a total blessing for me, you know, every time. Uh, uh, and that's what Paul's talking about here. When we really set out to serve others, you know, with the right attitude, <laughs> without grumbling and complaining, uh, you know, it's amazing how the Lord will, will use that person, that situation to actually encourage and uh, in minister uh, uh, to our own lives. So that's Paul's uh, purpose in going. Uh, and the theme certainly is the just shall live uh, by faith. In terms of a, a simple outline, Without going into too many uh, details here, uh, we'd say that uh, from the introduction, which ends at about verse 16, as he begins in about verse 17, until chapter 8, uh, we'll see principles of the righteousness of God by faith. Really what it is to be a Christian. He's going to begin to talk about the fact that uh, as his, his summary statement at the end of his first section is Romans 3.23 uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He's going to explain that religious people have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Non-religious people who have uh, never heard the gospel, never heard the name of Jesus, nothing. They also have sinned and come short of the glory of, of God. Uh, so there's a condemnation problem upon us, and then he'll launch into what it means to be justified by faith. A word that can also uh, be translated sometime righteous or how to have a righteous standing before God. But I like the term justification because it is a judicial term. Uh, and it's when the judge would pound his gavel down and say, innocent, it's finished. You're justified by faith. Such an important uh, doctrine. From that then, he'll begin to express then the frustrations uh, of what it is to really walk with the Lord. And he'll make a statement like, you know, what I want to do, I, don't, I end up not doing. And what I don't want to do, I end up doing that. Who will save me from this body of death? Thanks be to God in Christ Jesus. He says, you know, I can't live the Christian life on my own. I've been justified. My sins are forgiven. But life can be frustrating. What do I do? I need to learn to walk in the Spirit. It's going to, that whole section is going to be about the, the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Uh, and after that, then he'll talk about the security that we have in Jesus Christ. And he'll say that therefore is now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And he'll go on to say that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And then that will launch us into uh, chapters 9, 10, and 11, which we could say are the problems of the righteousness of God. As he begins to deal with uh, the rejection of Israel, Israel's past. Uh, chapter 10, Israel's present, and chapter 11, uh, Israel's future. And talk about the fact that, uh, again, the gospel is for the Jew first and then for the Gentile. The Gentiles, we've been grafted in you know, to this natural olive tree that is the Jewish people uh, in his Judaism. Uh, and it's through their scriptures and their Messiah that we've come in to have a relationship with him. And he's going to say, has God cast off his people, uh, Israel? By no means. He's still going to save them in the end. And he says, in the end, all Israel will be saved. And all that's meant to be an illustration. If nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, if there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, if we've been justified and our sins are completely forgiven because we have been saved by faith and faith alone, that Israel becomes the illustration. Israel, God will keep his promises to them no matter what. Let's look at their past. Let's look at their present. Let's look at their glorious future. And Paul uses those chapters to deal with the problems of the righteousness of God. And then in chapter 12 to 15, 
He'll deal with the practices of the righteousness of God. What it really mean, means to live the, the Christian life. And just some very, very practical uh, suggestions about living our life. He'll begin that section by saying, I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your spiritual act of worship. And then he'll go on to talk about that uh, as you do that, you'll be able to know what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect uh, will. Uh, again, taking the illustration as the Jewish rabbi that he was, speaking to many Jews that are in this church that would fully understand he's talking about the burnt, a whole burnt offering, uh, it's, which spoke of dedication. He says, our lives, understanding all that God's done for us, our lives should be like that sacrifice that's placed on the altar and then totally consumed. And that's what we want our lives to, uh, to be. Chapter 16, then he concludes with all of his uh, personal greetings. So, again, just kind of a brief, uh, brief overview, an overview of, of a book that has changed thousands and thousands of lives over the years. And we could certainly say it's changed Western civilization uh, as we know it today. Well, let's look at verse 1, Paul's personal introduction of himself. There we, he reads, uh, it reads, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. So his personal introduction includes the idea of being a bondservant. That's the Greek term we're familiar with, doulos, uh, the servant uh, of, uh, of all. <clears throat> Paul could have introduced himself, of course, as the Paul, the eminent theologian, master of the Old Testament scriptures, frontline warrior, brilliant of intellect, having studied with the great rabbi Gamaliel. How's it? <laughs> No, but he doesn't do that. He just starts out with this idea of, uh, of doulos, which would have been uh, shocking to a couple of different groups of people. Uh, to the Greek-speaking, again, Roman mindset, uh, there were 60, about 60 million slaves in Rome at that time, uh, in the Roman Empire at that time. Uh, and uh, that meant you were a piece of property and nothing else. Uh, this is the term that Paul is, uh, is using here. Uh, to many of them, that would have not gone over well. Uh, even to the Jewish writers, even though we had phrases in the Old Testament like Moses, the servant of the Lord, Joshua, the servant of the Lord, David, the servant, you know, uh, it's still to them, they esteemed those men, they realized they were servants of the Lord, but this is a different term. This Greek term, doulos, means you're a piece of property, uh, and we know from rabbinical writing uh, at that time, uh, nobody would have been uh, jumping up and down over the idea of being, uh, being a servant. I think, you know, within uh, at least Christian circles today, uh, it's mentioned so much. It's talked about enough. We're not so shocked when we read an introduction like this. Paul is servant of the Lord. He's a servant, you know. But we still don't really grasp because we're going to see that really all of us are called to be servants of the Lord. That means your, your life is given over to the Lord. You follow the master's uh, uh, direction in, uh, uh, in his bidding. But uh, it also would have spoken to another group of people uh, that would have made up uh, a portion of that church. And those are the people that really were slaves. Uh, the early church was made up of a lot of doulos, a lot of slaves. Uh, and you can understand, you live that life and there is no hope for your life, no hope for freedom. And you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, and that you can have a freedom in him and the future of, uh, of heaven with him. And it was very appealing. And uh, many of them came to faith in Christ. And for Paul to use this term uh, for them, I think, might have been kind of exciting. It's like, you know, he could have said the brilliant theologian and all that. They wouldn't have really related to him. But Adulos, they, they can kind of relate to, to that guy. We were out uh, <coughs> at White Plains doing some surf lessons for the kids uh, yesterday, which uh, was a lot of fun. And Reminds me how old I am every time we do something like that, but uh, it was a lot of fun. I'm not aching too bad today, but uh, there was, uh, uh, as we were out there, uh, you know, it was, you know, Saturday, a lot of folks around and had a guy uh, come by and, uh, and he, hey, Pastor Tim, that you? <laughs> and it's like, you know, it's like, I was surprised. I got my hat, sunglasses on, everything. <clears throat> anyway, I meet this guy. He goes to uh, Daryl's church. He lives out on the west side and his name is Micah. We start uh, shooting the breeze and stuff, and we talk a little bit. And then later, after we're kind of uh, done, and I'm kind of washing uh, my board off and everything, he comes over and talk a little bit. And he said, uh, "He says, so, so what? Pastor Tim, you used to live down in Cooley, huh?" 
And it's like, you know, somewhere along the men's retreat, he listens on the radio, he kind of picked that, picked that up. And I, <coughs> I was a, uh, anyway, I was just a hippie guy on the beach. We called people homeless today. I don't know what we called them then. But uh, again, I was never much of a flower child. I was more of a weed. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, I, was, uh, I lived out there for a period of time. Somehow he heard that, you know, me sharing a testimony or something. And he just went on and told me, he said, oh, that's, that's where I'm from. I'm from Nanakuli. And, you know, but, you know, it was just like, then he just went on and talked about, you know, the teaching, the ministry. And that was his first men's retreat last time. So he's all excited. He was really excited to hear that we do it every year, you know, and stuff, and that he can look forward to it uh, uh, again. But somehow just some little thing like that just kind of, you know, touched his heart and it's like, oh, maybe, maybe I can listen to this guy. Maybe this guy's got something, you know, for me, something not how I can relate to him. I, I just, I think Paul starting this letter to all those people that, and they were many, you know, in the early church that were slaves. Uh, Paul could introduce himself in a lot of different ways, but we see that he often refers to himself uh, as the doulos uh, of the servant of Jesus Christ. And on one other occasion, he uses another phrase that means an even a lower, a lower slave than the doulos. That's actually the term in the English we'd say the under rower. Those are those guys in the Roman ships that were in the galleys that were rowing, like in the Ben Hur movie. And uh, and it's the guys that are in the very bottom. That was the worst position you could possibly have. Paul identifies himself as that type of a servant uh, in one of his other letters. And of course, where does he get all of this? Well, he gets it from Jesus Christ who uh, often spoke about the idea, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you must be the servant of all. Uh, he says in Matthew 10, 24, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. In other words, if he's the master and he was a servant, that makes you a servant uh, as well. Paul makes reference to all of us being servants uh, in this reference in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. He says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The idea of being bought with a price is a reference to a slave being purchased at a slave market. And Paul says, we're all slaves. We're not our own. We were all bought with a price. And of course, that price was the blood of Jesus Christ. And then his kind of uh, epic description of the the nature of God in Jesus Christ in, uh, in his letter to the church there at uh, Philippi uh, in chapter 2, verse 8. He says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in form God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a doulos, that's our word there, bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. What was the nature of Jesus? That of a doulos, of a bondservant. He spoke about it. He demonstrated it. He washed his disciples' feet, which would be the position of the lowest servant of the home. If you entered someone's home uh, in the times of Jesus in the first century, uh, your feet would be, uh, would be washed, uh, but they would be washed by the lowest servant in the home. And, uh, and if the uh, owner of the home had no servants uh, and had to wash your feet himself, it was a statement of his abject poverty that he had to do that. And that's what Jesus does, of course, in the upper room, washing the feet. And he says, as I, as I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, so you now go and wash each other's feet. Uh, again, speaking of the servanthood model that he had for us. Secondly, he's not only a doulos, as he introduced himself in this personal introduction, but he mentions being an apostle. The word means one who is sent by authority with a commission. It was used uh, uh, usually of emissaries sent on behalf of an emperor or the king. That's their representative that's going out. And Paul, again, is not saying, and I made myself an apostle. <laughs> There's a, <clears throat> a few people around today that make themselves apostles, put it on their business cards and so forth. Wow. Apostle and deacon and you know, all these names and stuff. It's like, wow, you know, uh, pretty good there, you know. But uh, uh, Paul says, you know, I didn't make myself apostle. 
God called me. You remember, Paul was on the road to Damascus. He was the guy that was uh, Saul of Tarsus, uh, you know, uh, breathing out his threats against the church, persecuting men and women, separating them from each other, from their children, uh, beating them, putting them in prison, all to try to get them to recant their faith in Jesus Christ. This was the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus. It wasn't enough that he could do that to people in Jerusalem uh, and in Israel, but uh, he wanted permission from the uh, Sanhedrin letters that would allow him to go into another country, go, into, uh, de- go to Damascus, that he might persecute the church there as well. You remember the story as he, he leaves the, uh, goes to, uh, to the northern Israel, up the Golan Heights and down, and then went through the UN check right there and went right into present-day Syria. The UN wasn't there. It seems like they've always been around. But uh, he makes his way uh, uh, from the Golan Heights. You can see the UN checkpoint. But, uh, and you can see the, the, apostle, the road the Apostle Paul took into uh, present-day Syria, into Damascus. And, of course, on that journey, he is, uh, he is knocked on his backside. He is blinded, and God speaks to him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? Now, again, it's very interesting. Uh, was Paul persecuting Jesus? No, he was persecuting the church of Jesus Christ, people. But Jesus said, as you're persecuting them, you're persecuting me. And, uh, and he goes on and tells them, it's Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, Paul is converted on the Damascus road. And God says to him, Jesus says to him then, I am calling you to be an apostle and to take my gospel to, to the nation. So Paul says, I didn't dream this up. I just didn't think it was a good gig for me or something God called me into this and of course uh, that would have been uh, very very critical for Paul to have that understanding given the fact of his life experiences the guy that was beaten so many times I remember one time I kind of went through the the New Testament and uh, I wish I could have kept a record of it I I tried to figure out how many scars Paul would have had he he was beaten with rods Uh, he received the 39 lashes uh, on more than one occasion uh, besides the shipwrecks and uh, all the other things and being left for dead uh, and so forth. Uh, it'd be good to know that you didn't kind of dream this thing up yourself, you know, as he's there in the stocks in Philippi with Silas after having been beaten. And uh, I don't think he turned to Silas and said, now whose idea was this? <laughs> Are we having fun yet? Uh, no, he, he knew. He knew that it was God that had called him uh, to be an apostle. And then also in his personal introduction, he mentions this idea of being set apart. That's uh, New King James. We have the word there, separated to the gospel of God. Uh, and again, it's talking about what God did. It's interesting because the, the Greek word is very similar to the word Pharisee. Pharisees were separated unto the law to keep the law. And he says, you know, I was a Pharisee, but now I'm not separated unto the law. I'm separated unto God. And it's something that God has uh, has done uh, in in my life. And therefore, he's able to stand during all the difficult circumstances that he he faced. We might say this is Paul's self-perception. And uh, and it was that there was a a lifelong work of God going on in his life. uh, But it all began because... He was separated for the gospel of of God uh, by Jesus Christ. So if someone were to ask the Apostle Paul, who are you? He would say, I am Paul, a bondservant of Christ, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel. That is who I I am. And again, we've uh, mentioned the fact that we're, in some sense, we're all all set apart for the gospel. We've come to faith in Christ. And we're, uh, we're all, in a sense, uh, apostles in the sense that God is, <clears throat> we're emissaries of the king sent out uh, to proclaim the gospel and share the gospel with others. The Latin form of that word is where we get our word missionary. So uh, in that sense, uh, again, uh, certainly a missionary is somebody that we typically think of uh, goes to another culture and another uh, language uh, to share the gospel. But uh, in reality and... Uh, uh, every, every church should have over the door now entering the mission field because uh, we all have a mission field that, that we're in, that we're called to. We all have places of, of, of influence. You, you've got family members you can talk to that would never listen to one of my sermons. You've got people at work uh, that if you work hard and are, are, and are an outstanding employee, 
then you can earn the right and respect of those that you work with. And having done that, then you can earn the right at times to share your, your faith with them. If you're the lousiest employee they got, don't bother. But if you're the best one they've got, and that's your, that's your, uh, uh, your attitude each and every day you go to work, but certainly it should be, because you're representing Jesus Christ in the workplace. In time, you want to earn people's respect, whatever it is that you do for a living, doing it for the glory of God so that you can be that apostle, so that you can be that a missionary, because God set us all apart. Uh, we could all certainly agree with Paul's introduction here. <clears throat> Secondly, Paul's preaching was based on the prophets and the person of Christ. That's in verses 2 to 4. There it says, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared, declared to be the Son of God, with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. So Paul's preaching again is based on the prophets, and, uh, and of course we've just... Uh, uh, you know, went through Genesis and we, we traced uh, in the end in our summary just the promise of the Messiah in Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman. There would be one person that would be born who would destroy the works of Satan uh, all the way through the Abrahamic covenant. The promise there would be one person, the seed of Abraham, that would be a blessing to uh, the whole nation and how that was uh, even then uh, prophesied there in Genesis 49 of Jacob to his sons at the end that he would be in the tribe of Judah uh, and so forth. And of course, those promises continue. Uh, and Paul's preaching was based on the Old Testament, based on the prophets uh, he mentions there in verse 2. Therefore, Paul would be able to preach that, that uh, the Messiah would come and his mother would be a virgin. He would be born in the tribe uh, or the house of David. He would be born in the city of Bethlehem. He would be given the name Emmanuel. He would die a death, a violent death. It would be a death on a cross. But on that death on the cross, not one of his bones would be broken. He would, be, uh, he would die in the city of Jerusalem, but not just in Jerusalem. It would just be outside the city of Jerusalem. And you can imagine the Apostle Paul, uh, a Pharisee, having, probably having memorized most of the Old Testament, you can imagine listening to this guy preach in a synagogue about Jesus and the fact that he is the Messiah. And that was his M.O. That was his, uh, that's how he operated. He kind of, his tendency, of course, was to be prayed, be led by the Spirit. But if you follow him through the book of Acts, he, he for the most part, would track and go to big cities like Corinth, like Ephesus, uh, and others. He would find where the Jews met in that city. If there was enough men in that city, then they would have a synagogue. If not, they would meet outside the city near a river. They would have a designated place they would meet on the Shabbat or on the Sabbath. And that's who he would go to first. He would go because they all had the background. They understood the, you know, the scriptures. And he could reason with them from the scriptures in terms of who the Messiah was uh, in terms of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul would show up as Rabbi Shaul. He would show up having studied at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the greatest rabbinical teachers of all times uh, in Judaism, even considered to this day. He would be from Jerusalem, the holy city. So you get an itinerant rabbi with his kind of qualifications. It's like, won't you please come and address us this day? I think I will. And uh, so it was just a, an open door for him because of who he was, his education, the fact that he was from from Jerusalem. Of course, you know, as he preached, then, then some would want to hear him. Some would hear what he'd have to say. Others would reject what he'd have to say. But he's always able to say, you know, but I'll be over here giving lectures in, uh, at the uh, lecture hall of Tyrannius or wherever he was. And others would come. The other person that would uh, hear him very openly are, are those that we would refer to later as Gentiles at the gate. Gentiles at the gate, we were introduced to several of these men like Cornelius in the book of Acts, who were believed, they'd come to believe and reject. Can you, can you imagine having an argument with a Roman, an apologetic kind of argument? I'll give you the reasons for my faith that there's one true God that's the creator over other gods. You kind of give your best shot about Zeus and Apollo and these guys and kind of you know, give me the real reasons behind us why intellectually you can receive this. I've read some, uh, some of these arguments from um, 
uh, about the third century, uh, and it's it's the Christians just shred, and you know the the whole Roman um, uh, deities and demagogues and so forth because they're completely unreasonable. Because it's it's why we call it mythology today. It makes no sense at all. And uh, Paul would be able to these men give the reasons. Uh, why we believe there's one true God, why he is the creator, and why he sent his son to deal with the dilemma of sin in our lives and so forth. So men like Cornelius, these Gentiles at the gate, why did they stay at the gate? Because we know that many of them were there. They would attend synagogue. They would kind of be at the back. They would contribute uh, in everything to help, uh, help uh, Jewish people and so forth. Very generous. But they'd kind of hold back for one reason, it was called circumcision. <laughs> they would have a tendency to, I'm just kind of hold, hold it off here. And there was a lot of those guys and uh, uh, that wouldn't completely convert. That's why they were Gentiles at the gate. Those guys like Cornelius, man, they just thought, they would hear the gospel. They were just ready for it because it all made sense to them and they would receive the gospel. Paul would then have his his nucleus to kind of begin a church in that area. So he's got Jews and he's got Gentiles and they both can reach out. He'd raise up elders and disciple them uh, and then be on his way. But he was able to do it because he preached and was able to preach from the Old Testament scriptures uh, and from the prophets. We'd also say that his preaching is based on the person of Christ. Look at verse 3 and 4, 3 again. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh. The Greek here is um, expermatos, and it means the seed of David, literally the intense humanity of Jesus, that he was fully man. And then in verse 4, he equally stresses his divinity uh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. He's declared to be God's Son uh, he's declared to be that because of the Spirit of God and because of his resurrection from, from the dead. So as many writers have said, Paul's preaching certainly was dominated by Christ as being the Son of God. So uh, the balance of both in this opening statement in terms of what Paul's preaching uh, was all about. So a personal introduction, he says, I'm not doing this on my own. I've been appointed by God. God divinely set me apart uh, and that's why I refer to myself as his doulos, his servant. My preaching is always going to be based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the fact that Jesus is fully man and fully God. He mentions both of those things here. And then in verse 5, we see that it was Paul's privilege to share a message of grace. Verse 5, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. First, we'd say that it was a privilege to know God's grace. Uh, he says, I received my commission. The reason I'm an apostle, he says, is because of the grace uh, of God. Uh, grace was, uh, was always an amazing thing to the Apostle Paul. And you can imagine, maybe a lot of us have done some terrible things in our lives, some things that we're very happy uh, to be forgiven of uh, when we came uh, to faith uh, in Jesus Christ. And um, I, I know that I was, but you can imagine the Apostle Paul, uh, you know, the, the people he's now is going to minister to and try to embrace uh, are the people he was formerly uh, torturing, uh, imprisoning, uh, persecuting. And, um, and, you know, just frankly, nobody wanted to be around the Apostle Paul when he first got saved because they didn't really know it was the, it was the real deal and be like if... Uh, uh, Basad, Assad in uh, Syria who just killed 30,000 of his own people if he gets saved tomorrow and uh, received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We'd go, really? <laughs> okay, kind of show me something here. You know, is this the, so all of you rebels, you can just come out, you know, because I'm good. You know, it's like, really? I don't think so. We'll just kind of wait on that a little bit. And that's the way it was with the Apostle Paul. I mean, uh, people did not want to be around him for a very, a very long time. And uh, Paul never got over the grace of God, and, and neither should we. I mean, we sh it should always be uh, amazing grace, uh, how sweet the sound that saved not somebody like me, like some churches sing, but the original heirs that saved a wretch 
like me. And, uh, and that, that was Paul. He never got over the grace of God. One writer said, if we think we understand God's love and grace, we're probably without it. Because it's, it's pretty hard to get our minds around uh, God's love and, and his grace. That was his view of his ministry and his uh, apostleship. Uh, secondly, we say Paul saw a privilege to take the gospel notice to the nations. Uh, and again, that uh, apostle, one who is sent in the Latin means missionary. And um, uh, the church there in Rome was, uh, uh, of course, uh, met in that big building, you know, the Vatican. No, that wasn't there at the time. Just seeing if you're still awake. The, uh, uh, they met and uh, they were still, you know, under some persecution, although the persecutions are going to get worse under, under Nero. And, um, but uh, they met in several homes uh, throughout the, the city. As I mentioned, it was, uh, uh, there was uh, apparently a, a lot of Jewish people that were believers that were part of the church at Rome. Uh, because uh, Paul will, uh, will just see that in the, in the internal things that he talks about. Because once in a while he'll make reference, uh, he'll say something about, and you Gentiles too. <laughs> like, okay, I hope you guys are listening also. Um, so I don't know that it was predominantly Jewish, but there certainly uh, uh, seems to be a, a large amount of uh, Jewish believers in the church at Rome, as well as Gentile believers uh, that are there. And Paul says here, and makes reference to the fact that he actually has received a special commission by God to actually go to the Gentiles. Remember from the book of Acts, Peter considers himself and his calling as being the apostle to the Jews. And, uh, and, uh, and Paul was the apostle to the, the Gentiles. So hoping to make it to Spain, uh, wanting to get there, stop at Rome uh, along the way. And Paul had told the Romans, what he wants them to know about himself. He's a servant. He's God appointed, not self appointed. He's been separated out for the gospel. And the uh, very atmosphere of his life in his preaching is dominated by the superhuman God man, Jesus Christ, who rose again from the dead. He sees his commission, his apostolic power in terms of the incomprehensible grace of God. So his personal introduction his preaching, the privilege of sharing the gospel, and then his perspective of the believers themselves there in Rome in verse 6 to 7. Among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So well, I'd say first, uh, Paul's perspective of the believers included four things. And the first one is they were called by Jesus Christ just as all of us were called by Jesus Christ. When, when uh, you at some point in time uh, decided to place your faith in Jesus Christ, it was because God by his Holy Spirit was working in your life, drawing you to him. Uh, some of you may have wanted to have nothing to do with Christianity at one point in time. Uh, you thought that the message of the gospel was, uh, to use a theological term, Baloney from the Greek baloney, and uh, you wanted nothing to do with it. Uh, you could care less. Uh, and then suddenly, uh, it, it sounded interesting to you. You were curious about it. Suddenly, it made sense to you. And at some point in time, you realized it wasn't just something you needed. It was exactly what you needed. And at some point in time, you realized that the sin in your life was a burden, and the only way it could be taken away is if God would forgive you. And suddenly the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ made all the sense in the world to you. That's the Holy Spirit calling you, drawing you to himself. And Paul says, you guys are all called by God. And certainly we could relate to that. We must choose to answer, but the calling is from God. He says then, uh, they are the beloved, which means they're loved by God. He never mentions their love for God. He only mentions God's love for them. And uh, I love this quote from uh, Kent Hughes. I I've used it a few times. It's based on John 3.16 in the King James Version where, uh, where Kent writes, For God the greatest lover, so loved the greatest degree, the world the greatest company, that he gave the greatest act, his only begotten son the greatest gift, that whosoever the greatest opportunity believeth the greatest simplicity, in him, the greatest attraction should not perish, the greatest promise, but 
the greatest difference, have the greatest certainty, everlasting life, the greatest possession. Such a, no, no, no wonder we, uh, we say that verse so many times and, and for some of us it was the first verse that uh, we were required to, uh, to memorize. Uh, me with my grandmother, or I couldn't go to bed at night. <laughs> the whole time we would stay at their house, we would just go over this verse over and over again. But uh, the love of God for us, that's what Paul's talking about. No mention of their love for him. It's how great God's love is for them. And then notice that they were the, uh, the saints. Again, we're not called because we're saints. We're saints because we're called. <laughs> God calls us, draws us up us to himself and then he separates us uh, for him in Jesus Christ and that's the idea of being being saints. And I realize that the uh, Roman Catholic Church makes quite a big deal and there's some in the news now of uh, the next person from Hawaii that's going to be granted uh, sainthood soon and so forth and uh, uh, we understand the tradition uh, behind that and there's certain qualifications but biblically every person that is a Christian, a true Christian uh, is, is a saint. They've all come called by God, God's love, His grace, uh, and we're all saints. So that one you can add to your business card legitimately. Uh, the fourth thing he says to them is that they were called by grace to peace. And this is certainly the familiar um, greeting that we see from the Apostle Paul. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Je Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now it's interesting, Paul takes the, the Greek greeting which was, uh, we would translate it, rejoice. That's interesting. You know, I'm still old school, so I say how's it to people, especially if they're old like me. But uh, uh, they, they would say rejoice. Uh, it's a pretty cool greeting. But he, he takes that and he changes it to a, another Greek word that sounds similar, charis. Uh, and that means grace. So grace was not a greeting that Greeks used for each other. They used the rejoice. So he takes a similar sounding word and he changes it to grace. And then he adds the shalom, uh, the peace uh, on, on the end of it. So he combines these and this becomes his greeting. And of course, as, um, uh, as we should always point out, uh, it's appropriate that it's never, it's never peace and then grace, but always grace and then peace. Because you cannot know the peace of God unless first you know the grace of God. And I think that's certainly the point in his, uh, in his greeting here. Grace uh, and peace to you from God our Father uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, here we're going to study this together. And uh, I just pray that it'll be uh, life-changing for you. Uh, it's important certainly to know if you're a Christian, what does it mean to be a Christian? If we're saved by grace, what does that mean exactly? And if we talk about what it, to be justified by faith, what does that mean exactly? To be justified. If we talk about the fact that we can have the security of the life of the believer, that, uh, that God will always love me, watch over me, uh, and I can always look to him. He's always a breath away from me. Why do we make these kinds of statements? All these things are really explained and answered uh, in uh, Paul's epistle to uh, the church there at Rome. Uh, because we don't want to be, be confused. And I uh, was reminded this week of a couple of uh, kind of funny stories about, about confusion. One, one of them was uh, uh, when uh, we were at the air show a few weeks ago, watching the Blue Angels, and we were out there, and Tatsuhiko was out there with me, and he, uh, he said, uh, can I go over and take a picture of this guy's tattoo? His big guy had a tank top on, and uh, his tattoo was in kanji. And um, as, as often we found... <laughs> Uh, anyway, people don't always understand what it is that they've got tattooed on their bodies. And uh, I, said, I, saw, I saw the smile on his face. I asked him, what does it mean? He says it means woman power. <laughs> so he went over, took, took, took his iPad over, took a picture. And I asked him, he's, he's here, I asked him, did, uh, uh, did he ask what it means? And he, he said, yeah, I told him it meant strong power. I said, right. <laughs> Good, very diplomatic. And, um, but anyway... There was a, um, uh, I was talking to Travis uh, from Calvary Chapel Tokorozawa this week because we were talking about the men's retreat. And we're, there was an article in, uh, a while back that he told me about a, and, uh, a young guy, uh, uh, a holiday guy, you know, a Western guy in Japan 
and uh, he's in McDonald's, and he's paying for his order, and he's got two big tattoos on his forearms, one here and one here. And so the person who could speak some English asked him, do you know what the kanji says? He goes, yes, strength, honor. Oh, very good. What did it really mean? Left, right. <laughs> and then Tra Travis said, this week in the paper, there was a picture of a guy uh, going down the street, a Western guy, T-shirt on, kanji went down the front, beautiful looking kanji. What did it say? Hemorrhoids. <laughs> It's important to know what it says and what it means. For Christians, we, the book of Romans really explains our, our faith. We don't want to be making statements that are uh, almost right. We want to make ones that are, that are really true. I, uh, the last, it's been a number of years since we uh, taught through Romans, quite a long time ago. And um, at that time, uh, we'd go, Kathy's dad was still with us, and we'd go, over to their house every Sunday night, big tradition, do the barbecue and hang out and stuff. And uh, Kathy's dad uh, came out of a uh, you know, Roman Catholic background. And at that point in time, was still going to Mass and then coming on Sunday and you know, kind of catching, catching both. And I think it was you know, d you know, difficult if you're in that position like he was. Uh, that was a tradition. You know, Irish went back several generations. So, I mean, to not go would almost be like a denial to his parents or something. So, you know, he just went to both. You know, we were good with that. We'd go with him sometimes. It would just encourage him to go, you know, somewhere. And, uh, and he was, uh, uh, he was uh, having lots of questions. And uh, it was, uh, we could see him uh, really kind of moving, you know, towards a relationship in the Lord. And, uh, and sometimes we'd be, we'd be out in the backyard. We'd be barbecuing out there. And I'd ask him, you know, how, you know, what he thought of the Sunday morning message, you know, had any questions and, and so forth, and uh, had a lot of good discussions. But anyway, I asked him, we were, we were going through Romans 6 at the time, and I asked him if he uh, understood everything. He goes, yeah, but I have to tell you, it's, make, it's made me very upset. In fact, I'm, I'm mad about the whole thing. And I was like, wow, okay, well, what are you mad about exactly? You know, maybe I can explain something. He goes, no, it wasn't what you said. You told us what the Bible said. But he says, I went to church my whole life, and they never told us that. And he was upset by that. There's a lot of people that go to church, and they have no idea what this epistle says. Uh, and they can use those phrases like grace, like justification, like righteousness. But they're like the guy with the, with the kanji that says hemorrhoids. It's like, looks good to me, just don't really know what it says. It says whatever the guy in the store said, you know. And, uh, and we don't want to be like that in terms of our Christian experience. And we want to be able to know it so certainly we can share it and answer those questions of those around us. Well, let's pray.